wonder what's made by the guy that made Silent Hill. As a lot of you guys know by now, I'm a pretty big Silent Hill fan. The first game in the series is one of my most favorite games ever made, but I couldn't help but to wonder recently, what exactly did they do after they left Konami? I mean, after they made the first four games and Konami gave the series to the West to let the Americans develop the series, whatever happened to the original developers? What happened to Team Silent? I mean, they had to pay the bills somehow, they must have been working on something. Silent Hill all began with Keiichiro Toyama. He started his career as a graphic designer working on titles like Hideo Kojima's Snatcher, but when it was time for him to make his own game, man, did he ever deliver. After the first Silent Hill game was completed, he left Konami to go work for Sony Interactive Entertainment. It looks like Sony's got a great habit of picking up talented devs after they ditch Konami. Project Siren, a brand new development team was then created. Interesting choice in name, a siren, something very loud. Much unlike Team Silent, something very quiet. Sticking to the genre he knows best, Toyama and his team created a brand new survival horror game called Siren, also known as Forbidden Siren outside of North America. This is one of those games I always knew existed, I always knew about it, but I never really heard much about it. I guess it's not really held to the same caliber of quality as Silent Hill. Nevertheless, it's October, so I think you guys all know what that means. It's high time we find out what this baby is all about. The game starts with an 18-year-old boy named Kiyoya Suda wandering through the woods when he stumbles upon some sort of cult undergoing a ceremony. After being spotted, he runs back into the woods, briefly having a vision where he sees himself. He turns around to see a crazed police officer taking aim at him. And right here, we're given the very first objective of the game, escape from the police officer. It's also around now that you realize that Siren controls very much like the first Silent Hill, but ditching the fixed camera angles for a more traditional behind the player camera. It's tank controls, but in a more Resident Evil 4 kind of way, where it's easier to get the hang of because of the constant over-the-shoulder perspective. So the first thing you're gonna do is hide from the police officer. He's been turned into a Shibito, the main enemies of this game. They're essentially corpses reanimated by a powerful curse, but unlike zombies, Shibito still retain a sliver of personality that the deceased person had. For example, the principal Shibito still knows about the school and the children who went there, as if the curse has access to their brain and memories, but it still isn't necessarily them. A lot of the time, you're not not gonna have the means of defeating your enemies, so instead you'll have to hide from and sneak by them. Siren has a large focus on stealth, but with such a limited vision from the dark and the fog, that can be kind of tricky. This is where the game's main mechanic comes into play. When Kiyoya saw himself in the woods, he was seeing through the eyes of the police officer. The village he stumbled upon has somehow given him the power of clairvoyance, meaning he can see through the eyes of other people. Pressing the L2 button will enter sightjack mode. You'll then rotate the left stick to tune in and out of the eyes of the monsters on the map. It's like tuning a radio, slowly turning a dial to change what station you're on. When looking through somebody's eyes, you're represented as a pair of crosshairs. This makes it easy to figure out whether or not they're looking in your direction. You can also quick map up to four Shibito to the face buttons for quick access. This is super helpful. If there's a handful of guys you really want to keep tabs on, you can use this to make switching to their eyes super quick. It's a very necessary feature because the direction you aim the stick in to sightjack each Shibito is always changing. It's relative to the way that you are facing. So for example, 
example, if a guy is on your right, pressing the stick to the right will tune him in, or if he's behind you and to the left, down left will tune him in. Using this power, you'll have to try and judge where the enemies are on the map, making sure they're not looking your way when you make a break for it. It's also helpful for figuring out if any of them have weapons. If a Shibito is holding a revolver, you better not get seen by it, harmed or not. But if a Shibito has a sniper rifle, you're gonna have to look through his eyes to figure out which area to avoid completely. It only takes one to two bullets to take you out, so be careful. There's a bit of a puzzle aspect to it as well. Sometimes you'll need to find an item and you can sightjack somebody to see them looking at it. It is a very unique and super cool game mechanic. It's also an extremely clever way to enhance the scare factor. Just imagine tuning into somebody and seeing yourself. It's freaky. You know, a big problem I have with modern horror games is just how long you have to wait in a closet waiting for the monster to go away. Luckily, the monsters in Siren don't have much of an attention span. The game's focus is more so on avoiding them completely. Getting caught usually isn't either an option or it's something that isn't frustratingly annoying to get away from. But of course, if you do get seen, running away will hinder your ability to fulfill whatever objective you're trying to do. I feel it hits a perfect sweet spot. There isn't too much waiting that I get frustrated, but it's not too forgiving either. One thing in regard to the stealth that I'm not super big on is just how slow you go when you crouch walk. If you really don't want to make any noise whatsoever, you're gonna have to walk at this cumbersome pace. Though I guess if there's no one right beside you, walking will usually suffice. After beating the first couple of missions, you'll then take control of a different character, Tamon Takaguchi, a professor lost in the cursed village with one of his students. You'll play as many different characters throughout the game, all in the cursed village for different reasons. The story is very non-linear, events are all played completely out of order, being told what time and on what day they took place on this time chart beforehand. You know, the more I look at this thing, the more I realize it, it just looks like Microsoft Excel. There are a total of 10 playable characters throughout the story. Kyo Yasuda, an 18-year-old boy who gets caught up in things while exploring the mountains. Tamon Takaguchi, a university professor and former resident of the Cursed Village. He came back to discover why his parents died when he was a child. Kei Makino, a priest involved in the ritual, uncovering the evil nature behind the curse. Akira Shimura, a 70-year-old hunter native to the town struggling to survive. Naoko Mihama, a television host who gets lost in the mountains after being separated from her film crew. Reiko Takato, an elementary school teacher trying to escape with her young student, Harumi Yomodo, who is also playable. Shiro Miyama, a scientist studying the Shibido, searching for his nurse assistant Mina. Risa Onda, twin sister of Mina, teaming up with Shiro to search for her, and finally, Tomoko Maeda, a young girl who ran away from home right before the curse took place. Each of the characters have their own reasons for being in the cursed village. Some of them even cross paths, and some of them don't even make it out alive. Completing a mission will branch you off leading to another mission. It could follow up with the same character, but more often than not, it'll spiral you to a totally different character at a totally different time. Early on, the missions usually consist of simply escaping the area. Get from point A to point B be nice and simple. Sometimes you'll have another character with you having to escort them along with you. Now I know what you're thinking. Oh boy, escort missions. Well, I can easily say I've played far worse. Your partner character does a competent job at keeping up with you, but if carrying them along all the time isn't your forte, it's very easy to leave them behind until you've found a safe pathway through. Many of the later missions, you don't even have to bring them with you. You can just leave them behind and take care of things yourself, so long as the mission isn't about leaving the area. The only character I got sick of escorting was Miyako. She's blind, but with the power of clairvoyance, she can see through your eyes. This means if she gets too far behind, simply looking in her direction will show her the path forward. It's a cool idea, but honestly, I'd rather she just be able to keep up with me anyway. Can't you walk a bit more slowly? When you first meet her, she's mourning the death of her dog, and you know, it didn't really hit me until much later in the game, but she would have kept a dog with her so she could use it to see. A seeing eye dog, I guess you could say, but in a much more literal sense. The game never upright tells you that, it's something you'll have to notice for yourself, and it's a really nice touch if I do say so myself. This place is messed up. Let's just go to the church together. And, and then think about what to do. The game was localized in Europe, and all of the characters have British accents as a result. Professor, we need to find the villagers. 
please shut up. Much like the localization of Xenoblade Chronicles, it came out in Europe a whole month earlier than it did in the West, which was also likely a result of the British localization. The voice acting isn't terribly great, it's uh, it's passable I guess, some of the characters definitely have a better delivery than others, but it comes off as weak in a lot of areas. Oh, an earthquake. It's not done on purpose either, like Silent Hill 2's was. Silent Hill 2 had really weird voice acting on purpose in an attempt to enter the uncanny valley, making the player feel like something was off. And though that was the purpose, to me Silent Hill 2's voice acting just felt adorably bad. Can't be even. I was never bothered or creeped out by it, but I always loved it. However, in a different way, Siren still manages to pull off the uncanny valley, this time through facial animation rather than voice acting. Instead of traditional modeling and texturing for the characters' faces, they used a facial capture rig, photographing the faces of the Japanese actors from eight different angles. It's like a very primitive version of the technology they used in L.A. Noir, but due to limitations at the time, it feels more like a 2D capture rather than a full 3D image. You get this very unsettling result, facial animation that looks much too photorealistic for its era and superimposed on a model that's just not not quite in a time where they can make it look right. It makes me really uncomfortable. It's like an image of someone's face being projected onto a mannequin that doesn't actually have a face. The realistic facial movement on an otherwise unrealistic character it freaks me out. It doesn't look right at all. But that is exactly what they were going for. That's exactly what they were trying to make me feel. It sets the mood remarkably well. From the very beginning, you feel like something is just wrong, exactly as you should feel when playing a psychological horror game. Now, while the visuals are great at doing what they're trying to do, the weak English voice acting kind of makes me wish they also included an option for the Japanese audio with English subtitles, especially with the game being very much focused in Japan with the Japanese setting, Japanese characters, and Japanese folklore. This again contrasts Silent Hill, which was a very Western-inspired game with American characters and American settings. But things are as similar as they are different. You can very much tell this is the same guy that made Silent Hill. The use of fog and darkness are still very prominent with the characters wielding flashlights to pierce through it. Having the flashlight on is actually a pretty bad idea a lot of the time. If you have that thing on, you're guaranteed to get spotted by a Shibuya. While the darkness is an obstacle, it's also something that you'll take advantage of. The Shibito also have flashlights because they can't see in the dark any better than you can. Of course, when you have much more reason to have the flashlight off, you're gonna need to compensate for that, making the game still somewhat playable in the dark. To address this, there's a small hypothetical glow around your character, allowing you to still see things that are very close. The combat is also very much like Silent Hill. There's melee weapons and ranged weapons. Holding down R1 will ready your weapon, auto-targeting onto your enemy. Pressing the X button will do a light attack, and holding the X button does a heavy attack. It's more or less the same as Silent Hill. Clunky, but you can get good at it. Though I find the heavy attacks with some weapons can be a tad unresponsive, making combat unnecessarily frustrating at times. More specifically, using the pipe as Reiko Takato in the school. Fighting the principal with it is a little harder than it should be, though I found found out if you mash the X button using a light attack, she'll just keep hitting him because he just runs at you really fast. Guns also work the same way. Hold down R1 to take aim and press X to fire. Having the flashlight on will greatly increase your accuracy. Now rifles you'll get to aim manually using the right stick to zoom in and out. These are great for taking out those pesky sniper shibitos, but pretty much anything else as well. Whether or not you even have access to a weapon entirely depends on what character you're playing as and on what day. Some missions will have you starting without a weapon and you'll find one halfway through. Some missions you'll start with a weapon and some missions you won't have a weapon at all. Some characters get guns, some characters get rifles, some characters only get melee weapons. It's all situational, you'll be thrown into all sorts of predicaments, and you'll have to learn to play the game with what you're given. One thing I like about this game's combat over Silent Hill's combat is that the camera will swing more over the shoulder, giving you a better view of the oncoming Shibito. This makes it a little easier to figure out the proper timing when swinging a weapon. But also unlike Silent Hill, the enemies never stay dead. The Shibito are corpses reanimated by supernatural forces, so naturally, 
they can't die, they're already dead. Killing a Shibita will only incapacitate it for probably about a minute. It's easily long enough to get whatever you're doing done, but that doesn't mean you can just forget about them. In some situations, it's good to leave that Shibita you just took out mapped to one of the buttons so you can still keep tabs on him and figure out if he's gotten back up or not. And there's also multiple types of Shibito. Ones that have been exposed to the curse longer will walk on all fours. They're faster and harder to predict. What's more, there's also spider ones that can walk on the walls. These two types don't stay dead very long at all, maybe about like 10 seconds. However, these guys can't go through doors, so the best way to deal with them is to make sure you're closing every door you go through behind you. Some of them even have insect-like wings and can fly around. These guys always have a revolver and are extremely annoying most of the time. But that's really it for enemy types, and none of them are particularly terrifying looking. I feel the game could have used a handful more enemy types, something more absurd and freaky like Silent Hill's monsters. I can easily say I didn't find Siren to be quite as scary as the Silent Hill games, and I think a big part of the reason for that is the lack of enemy types. Not even halfway through, I've already seen every kind of monster at least once, so by then I pretty much knew what to expect. I I think introducing a handful more monsters and placing them where you'd least expect them could help the game scare factor. That's not to say the game's not scary. Sightjacking into a Shibito just to realize that they're creeping up behind you is all sorts of scary. I suppose it more so relies on the game's mechanics and atmosphere to build up tension and fear rather than the monsters themselves, but a healthy mix of both could have benefited the game greatly. But I will say the game's sound design is absolutely fantastic, easily on par with that of Silent Hill. The music consists of droning noise noise, radiating that unfathomable dread that just seeps right into you. Not to mention that heavy breathing you'll hear every time you sightjack a Shibito. It is the stuff of nightmares. <sighs> Do yourself a favor and play this game with headphones. You will not regret it. Or maybe you will regret it because you'll probably get pretty freaked out playing the game that way. So far, it seems like a pretty solid horror game. I mean, it's got a great atmosphere and fantastic tension-building game mechanics that keep you scared, but this is where things start to get a little rough around the edges. After you beat the first couple of missions, you'll find yourself repeating the missions that you already did, but this time it'll say something about a secondary objective, but it's not super clear on how to do it or what to do, so most people playing are gonna probably accidentally do the first objective again, and what does it say when you do that? Mission accomplished! Okay, but now we're doing another mission over. You get stuck in this loop that's really hard to make sense of. So what you have to do while replaying these levels is figure out how to do these secondary objectives. Doing one of these will branch you off to a different stage with a different character. The game will continue to loop until you've figured out how to do these secondary objectives. It usually requires finding a certain item in the stage instead of just leaving the area. The game's all about unlocking new pathways, seeing new bits of the story, and piecing it all together. Though the way they link some of the levels together is very ambitious and not very well executed. After the first couple of loops, you'll unlock a level select, meaning at any time you can open up the link navigator, select any stage you want, go for the secondary objective, and advance the plot. But this is where things start to get really confusing. A lot of the game's puzzles require changing things in the level at an earlier time as a different character, but the problem is you have no way of knowing that there's something you're missing. Here's an example. Shiro Miata has a level where you simply need to escape the town, but the secondary objective is to find an ID holder. So you sight Jack through everybody in the map, discovering a Shibito who's eating something in the kitchen, and what's in his right hand? The ID card. Okay, so you make your way to the house with the kitchen, but the door is locked, so obviously we gotta find a way to get him to open the door. There's a piggy bank here, okay, sure, we break it, he hears it, he comes out, but he's got a gun, and every time you break that piggy bank, he comes out, sees you immediately, and kills you. This was the first time I had to look up a walkthrough because I just could not figure this out, and there was nothing here that even hinted that there was something I had to preemptively do to allow me to finish the mission. Okay, so here's what has to be done. K. Makino's mission in this stage takes place at an earlier time, so you have to play that mission. But on the way to the goal, you have to find a towel, soak it in the sink, and put it in the freezer. None of this has 
anything to do with Kay's objective, so you would have no way of knowing you have to do it. But anyway, back at Shiro, you then attempt the stage, now take the frozen towel out of the freezer, place it between the counters, put the piggy bank on top, and wait for it to melt, dropping the piggy bank. And this gives you enough time to leave, so when he opens the door, you're not in the way and he doesn't kill you. I mean, it's a cool puzzle. It's, it's a really cool puzzle, it really is, but how in the hell was anybody supposed to figure that out. The problem is that you have to set things up in a completely unrelated mission. It's like, it's metagaming. Finding that towel and freezing it has nothing to do with the task at hand, and you're completely going to miss it without even knowing there's something that you missed. And puzzles like this are sprinkled all throughout the game. Maybe you'll have to unlock a door so a character can get in through later, or find an item that you'll need later. But these things are so easily missable, and even harder to realize is that you miss something. Another example is again a Shiro in the hospital level. You have to hunt down a certain Shibito. You make your way down into the basement checking each room, room by room. You eventually find her, take her out, and the mission is over. But uh, too bad you didn't look in the room after the one that she was in because there's a crucial item in that room that you need to finish a later mission. But of course, naturally playing the game, you're going to miss that item because the mission ends one room earlier, unless you just decided to skip that room for whatever reason you're not only going to not have the item, but you're going to have no way of knowing that you don't have something you need. There's no dialogue in the later level like, if only I had a wooden stake. I think I saw one back at the hospital. No, the game just expects you to somehow figure that shit out. How do you expect me to go back to a level to get an item I missed if I don't even know that I need an item and I don't even know that I missed an item? I think the worst one is definitely when you have to light the lanterns as Takato and the mire. Firstly, you need candles, but the game doesn't tell you you need candles, you just have to somehow figure out that you don't have something that you need. So to find the candles in an earlier stage, you have to hide Harumi in this very specific closet, and you get no confirmation immediately, but later in the stage, if you did that, there'll be a cutscene where the kid's like, oh, but found some candles, here you go. She doesn't even tell you that they were in the closet or where she got them from, so you'll have no idea what triggered this cutscene giving you the candles. Not only that, but to make the lanterns even usable, you'll have to find these four hidden switches in four unrelated levels and scenarios as four totally different characters. How the hell was I supposed to figure all that out? How anybody on the planet beat this game without a walkthrough is completely beyond me. I mean, let's slow down for a minute. It is a rad idea, it is, it's really cool. It's kind of like Majora's Mask's 3 day system, but on a much more disjointed scale. It's presented in a way that's so difficult to understand and hard to figure out what to do. What the game desperately needs is better hints, because let me tell you, there are hints, but they're almost useless. So you can't beat a level because there is a prerequisite from an earlier stage you didn't meet, right? Okay, so next time you play that earlier stage, which you wouldn't because you wouldn't know that you need to do anything there, it'll then give you the hint. This needs to show up the first time you play the level, otherwise you'll never see it unless you know to go back to it. Okay, so here's what the game needs. A. Hints to show up the first time you play a level. B. Hints to also show up in other levels, hinting at what levels to go back to. C. A checklist. The level select screen really needs some sort of checklist of requisites that have and have not been met. If you saw a blank check space that said something like, open the floodgates or unlock bathroom door, you'd look at that and think, oh, there's something I missed that's gonna unlock a pathway for another character later in the level. You'd look at that and you'd actually be able to figure out how these things correlate with one another. But since the game doesn't have that, you're just gonna be lost. I don't think I've ever been this conflicted when playing a game for Nitro Rad before. For. I mean, the gameplay is great, it's fun, it's scary, it's just like, what do I do, dude? Like, if you're playing this game with a walkthrough, it can be a great time, it's just that I don't really see any other way of getting through it. Unless, I guess, you're like an extremely patient person who doesn't mind an inane amount of trial and error, and you're extremely thorough? When the game's not being ridiculously elaborate with the puzzles, it's your pretty standard Silent Hill kind of stuff. Finding a series of keys in the shape of items that you'll use to pave a way forward. It especially starts to feel like Silent Hill when you end up in areas like the hospital or the school, but unlike Silent Hill, the entire map is loaded all at once rather than having a loading screen between each room. This means you're not necessarily safe just because you entered a room. It keeps the tensions high. One really interesting thing about this game is 
is how the map screen works. Unlike any other game that I've ever played, it doesn't actually show your location on it. There's no little arrow pinpointing your current position. Instead, you're given a list of landmarks that you can flip through which will highlight it on the screen. You'll then have to look around your surroundings trying to find one of these landmarks to try and judge where you are on the map. I didn't like it at first, but the more I used it, the more I realized it's kind of like using an actual map in real life. It's not hard to use. It's really not. You just gotta put a little more thought into it than you normally would. And while the story isn't linear and a little difficult to understand what's going on at times, the further you go, the more and more you can make sense of it. And it's extremely satisfying to see it all come together in the end. But the ending is just, well... Well, since you're completely free to play the game in whatever order, they made like five of the later missions just cut to the ending when you beat it. So if you managed to make it that far, regardless of what path you chose, regardless of what missions you couldn't really figure out, here you go. Here's the ending. But because five random missions lead to it, regardless of the situation your character was just in, it cuts to this. What? What is going on? Where'd he get all that? What is this music? Holy shit, he's kicking ass! And it just... What is it? Oh, that's oh, that's the credits! Okay, that's it! I guess... What? I was so confused when I first saw this, but the game does keep going. It'll bring you back to the Link Navigator where you can choose more stages to play. If you do all of the secondary objectives, unlocking every mission and cutscene, you'll get the real ending. And it does kinda end just in the middle of things, but it does strongly hint that all of the characters that you've been rooting for all this time do make it out alright. Because you know, I actually found myself liking a lot of these characters quite a bit. I think my favorite was probably Shiro, he's such a mad scientist trying to figure out the the secret of everlasting life, and when he finds it, he just drops it on the counter like, eh, there it is. This is the secret of everlasting life. It doesn't matter how you cut them up, they just regenerate. I can't do much about it now. You're insane. And Kei Makino just thinks he's nuts or something until it finally hits him as well. Everlasting life means everlasting pain. The game was released on PS4 as a PS2 classic. This is your best bet for getting into it. It looks great in 1080p, and finding a physical copy on PS2 might prove slightly difficult. Unfortunately, Siren didn't really sell all that well. It wasn't even received that well either, to be brutally honest. It was subject to a lot of mixed reception. And I completely understand that, really. I mean, it is a plethora of fantastic ideas that work great on paper, but are way too ambitious to work that well in practice. It is one of the most non-beginner friendly games I've ever played. And if you look at the trophy data for the PS4 version of the game, you'll see that only about 5% of people who bought the game even unlocked the level select. That's not even two hours into the game. I think that really goes to show how off-putting this game's structure is. If you play this game without a walkthrough, you're going to be having a pretty miserable experience. You're going to be confused, and you're probably not going to make it that far. But that said, I would still very much recommend this game. I think it pulls off horror very well with brilliant mechanics, fantastic atmosphere and sound design, and a fairly satisfying story. It's just play it with a walkthrough. So that is Siren, but we're only getting started. About two or so years later, they came out with a sequel, Forbidden Siren 2. Yeah, notice that Peggy rating there never came out in North America. I guess us Americans were too dumb to figure this shit out. But after playing the first Siren game, I'm excited to see what they'll do with the sequel. They might have even addressed some of the things I criticized the game for. Who knows? It might be a little less confusing. Guess we'll find out next time when we tackle Forbidden Siren 2. See you guys then. So just kind of like yeah. run at the camera. Yeah. <laughs> Go. <laughs> just break it. Seize the blood. On <laughs> <laughs>